Morning. Good morning, and welcome home to Crossroads. I'm glad you're here, and we want you to know there's a place for you here. The call to worship this morning comes from Psalms 95, verses 1 through 6, 
and this is the NIV. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for bringing here. We thank you for your comforting and energizing presence. And we ask that you bless this house and bless your family. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand and sing with me. Number 435 in the blue hymnal. We gather together. and welcome to Crossroads. It's a joy for me to be here. My name is Jeff, and a very special welcome for those of you who are here for the very first time. Uh, It is our prayer and hope that while you are here, you will be strengthened, encouraged as we worship uh, our great God and Savior together, and we hear his word proclaimed. Um, And we encourage you, we want to get to know you. So again, if this is your first time here with us this morning, we invite you to take a few moments and fill out the tear out tab that's in the bulletin. This is a way that you are able to connect with us and us with you. Um, if so if you'll take a few moments and fill that out, and here in a little while there'll be an opportunity for us to worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings, and we invite you just to place that there. And then also as a reminder for our regular family that's here, that if there's a prayer request or a special need, this is always still a good way that you can communicate with us. Uh, Well, we have a few announcements just to call your attention to. One really primarily, and that is Barbecue Bonanza. Now, how many of you over your time here have been a part of Barbecue Bonanza in the past? Awesome. There's there's a lot of hands. Some of them didn't go as high. Uh, I can see them up here. But let me just encourage you that this is a great opportunity, not, not only to learn a good skill, but a great opportunity to be in fellowship with other believers. And not only that, but you, you gain this skill that in God's grace you're able to use it in ministry while you're here and then wherever the Lord leads you afterwards. And so we encourage you to consider this. This year it's only happening one time. Uh, every year we normally do it in the spring and then the fall, or rather I should say the fall and then the spring. Uh, this year we're only doing it in the fall. So certainly we pray that you would consider this. All the information is in the uh, insert here in the bulletin. And then also want to invite you that if you have not found your place 
in Bible study, we encourage you to do that. That is one of the greatest ways that you can connect with us at Crossroads and grow in your faith. And we have a lot of Sunday school, uh, Sunday school programs that are happening uh, really for all age groups. You'll see several of them listed here primarily for our adults. Uh, but again, we have them for all age groups, and I myself have the privilege of leaving uh, our youth. And this is our high schoolers from ninth grade to 12th grade. And so if you're a high schooler here this morning, or you have one, and maybe they're not here this morning, uh, we encourage you to bring them along. Uh, we're starting our study back in the book of Genesis, picking up with uh, Joseph. I'm sorry, with Jacob and continuing on, seeing really the grace of God in their lives and what it means for us today. One more quick announcement is that some of you are like, who is this guy? He talks as if he knows us. Uh, I had the privilege of being a part of this community in the past, but we have one other person that is relatively new here with us this morning. He's been a part of our family primarily up at the 11 o'clock service, and that's Chaplain Jared Vineyard. He's sitting here behind me. And so, uh, brother, we're excited to hear you bring the word of God. Many of you will remember Chaplain Kuman, Scott Kuman. He was our garrison chaplain who left here, actually went to Fort Moore. And it wasn't long until I received a call, and he's like, Jeff, you've got a rock star who's coming up here to Fort Leavenworth. And so, brother, we're excited that you're here, and certainly look forward to you open up the word of God for us here in a moment. Well, let me encourage you to stand and turn to the person next to you this morning and welcome them. And then we'll join again in worship in just a moment. Jesus, what a friend for sinners, Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me, he my Savior. Jesus. 
As we're standing now is the time of the service where we affirm what we're standing on. So Christians, tell me, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> now it's time for our congregational prayer, and we will end the prayer uh, aloud with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for allowing us to come before you. What a privilege it is to stand before the creator of the universe. We are in awe. I realize this loving communion is possible <clears throat> through your grace, through your mercy. And I know that I have fallen short, I fall short, I sin every day. But you have told us if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's a mercy that is also a miracle. Lord, the world is fractured. It's been fractured since our fall. There's war in Europe, many wars in the Mideast. There's war in Myanmar. Wherever there's war, we ask for peace. And we especially ask for your hand of protection around the innocent. Here in our own country, we're preparing for an election, and we feel fractured as well. Lord, I pray for wisdom for our leaders, both elected and appointed. And I pray that your spirit will touch each of us and will shine in this fractured world and reflect your love. Here on this here in this community, I also pray for the for wisdom for the appointed and elected the elected leaders. And in our congregation, uh, I ask you to bless the Sunday school classes that are starting this morning that we will be built up as members of the body of Christ. In our congregation, we have <coughs> people who are ill and we ask for healing, people who are about to go into surgery or who have just come out of surgery and we ask for safety and healing for comfort. We have hurting hearts and we ask for 
comfort and a peace beyond understanding. We have members of our congregation that are traveling and we ask for traveling mercies. Lord, we ask all these things, uh, especially in the way that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And the ushers would please come forward.
Father, we thank you for your bounty, and we ask that this tithe be used for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. The children are dismissed. Please remain standing for scripture. Our scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. It can be found on page 1156 on your pew Bible. Hebrews 12, 11 through 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord. Please be seated. Well, amen. Well, thank you so much. It's good to be with you today. My name, again, is Jared Vineyard. Uh, I'm a newer chaplain here to Fort Leavenworth, not a new chaplain. Uh, my job is the uh, instructor at the Command General Staff College. So I'm an ethics and world religions instructor. Uh, I was an instructor for three years at the Maneuver Center. It uh, used to be Fort Benning, now Fort Moore. And my family and I uh, moved here in, I think, mid-late July. So we're finally getting settled. You'll see them around. We've been at the 11 o'clock service. My wife, Amanda, we've been married for 22 years. Uh, we've got six kiddos. So four boys, two, yeah, I, that's true. Four boys, two girls, and uh, our oldest is at uh, West Point right now. He's uh, second year there, but the other five are, are, are with us. So you'll see them probably running around here and there. Uh, but it's good to be with you today, and uh, it's great to open God's Word. If you don't have your Bibles open, I'd encourage you. Hebrews chapter 12. And the title, which is up here, is also the big idea of these two verses, and that's what I'm going to talk to you today about, is the idea, run. And, and some of you, when you hear that word, uh, maybe it's a positive feeling. Some, may, maybe not so much. And just out of curiosity, when you see the picture, when you think of the term run, raise your hand if that's a positive emotion. Okay, five of us. No, there's a couple more. I, and I like to run, I do. Raise your hand if it's not real positive. Okay, and, and there, there's some that it's not real positive as well. Well, regardless if it's positive, negative, we in the military are very acquainted with the concept of running. Why? Because we have to do it. And, and I know some of the retirees have told me, the day I retire, I will never run again. And, and, and that's some experience and that's not others. Uh, but it's something we get tested on. And, uh, and I will get tested on running as well as some other things in about a month. Uh, and it's something that I'm very familiar with. And I, and I do like to run. I, it's one of those things where I just go out and I just forget about the world and, uh, and I just go. Uh, but regardless of what we experience or what we think about running, uh, the authors of the New Testament were very aware of running. In fact, running is used in a, as an analogy or a metaphor throughout the New Testament. The Apostle Paul will write in 1 Corinthians about running. He'll write in Galatians about running. He'll write in Philippians about running. And here in our text today, the author of Hebrews uses running as an appeal uh, when it comes to our faith. And so we're going to look at that. But before I get into these just two verses this morning, I'm going to give you a presupposition of mine or a belief. Every letter in the New Testament, the epistles, the letters, every letter was written to believers. Now, it may be an individual believer, it may be a congregation of believers, it may be to the church at large, but all of the letters in the New Testament are written to believers. Well, what does that mean? It means every letter presupposes the gospel. It assumes that the recipients know the gospel, 
have bought into it and are in doing one way, shape, or form trying to live it. Now let me ask you a question. If I were to ask you, what is the gospel? What would you say? Now again, you, you could go different directions, but uh, in my last chapel at Fort Moore, uh, we, we tried to challenge the people to say we've always got to be ready in season and out of season to share the gospel. We've got to live the gospel. So the question is, what is the gospel? Because it presupposes the book of Hebrews. It presupposes the epistles. And so one of the things that we talked about is the gospel in three sentences is you have a problem, God has an answer, you need to respond. We have a problem. What is that problem? Sin. We're not perfect. God has a solution. What is that solution? Or maybe who is that solution? Jesus and his atoning work on the cross and his rising from the dead three days later. We have to respond. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We have a problem. God has a solution. We need to respond. The book of Hebrews presupposes that the readers understand that. And, and so what's fascinating is I'll make the argument, and I'm going to oversimplify it, that every letter in the New Testament is essentially doing two things. One or two or both. Every epistle is saying this. Now that you're a believer or because you're a believer, here's what you need to know or here's what you need to do or not do. Every letter is simply getting at that. Now that you're a believer... Here's what you need to know, or here's what you need to do, or not do. The book of Hebrews follows that logic. In fact, the first nine chapters, nine and a half chapters of the book of Hebrews, it's all about one big idea. You need to know something. What do we need to know? I'm going to say it, I'm going to ask you to repeat it. Jesus is greater. Let's say that. Jesus is greater. One more time. Jesus is greater. Than what? Than anything. And the logic of Hebrews is he's greater than angels. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the high priesthood. Jesus is greater. And for nine and a half chapters, that's what the author is getting at. Jesus is greater. And then in chapter 10, he pivots. And he says, now you need to do something with this. And the rest of Hebrews is going to be, this is what you need to do with it. Hebrews 11, one of the most famous chapters in the Bible, is about, and look, oh, by the way, this is what the saints of the Old Testament did based on what they knew. First nine and a half chapters of Hebrews is this is what you need to know. And today, we're in the section of this is what you need to do with that knowledge. Now, why does he write this? And this, again, we can get into the deep background of Hebrews, but I'll make the argument <clears throat> that the book of Hebrews is written to a church that's getting older. <clears throat> They've been believers for 10 years. 20, 30 years, excuse me, <clears throat> they've been running, and they're getting tired. In chapter 10, there's been persecutions in the past, but now what's happened is the church, in a lot of places, have gotten comfortable. They've started to meander. They've started to wander. They've lost their focus. And the author of Hebrews is reminding, he's encouraging, he's extolling. Remember, Jesus is greater than anything. And today, what I would offer you is I believe the high watermark of the book of Hebrews. I would offer you that today, this, what we're going to look at, is the climax of the book. He's been saying, Jesus is greater Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater. And then in the text today, he's going to climax with what do we do with that knowledge. So if you look in your Bibles, uh, I'm actually going to back it up. I'm just going to back up two verses to Hebrews 11, 39 and 40, which will put us into the first two verses. And all of these, verse 39, <clears throat> though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God providing, provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. Let me pause very quickly. What? This assumes we've been reading through Hebrews. We know who he's talking about. The saints of the Old Testament. 
I don't know if you caught that. They didn't receive what was promised because of you. We perfect them. And they perfect us. It's the body of Christ concept. Verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God. This, I would argue, is the point of the book of Hebrews. The idea is Jesus is greater, so what do we do, church? Run! Since Jesus is greater, what do we need to do? We need to run! That's exactly it. Now, it's a metaphor. It's not, everybody get up, we're going to take a lap, right? It's a metaphor for what we need to do in our spiritual lives. We need to run. Because we think of faith and we often think of passive. We often think of deep down in our heart. And the author of Hebrews says, no, 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 no. Faith is not passive. It's what? It's active. It's not in our heart. It's in every cell of our body. Because when we run, we use everything. And he says, we've got to get up and we have got to run. Well, how do you do that? In these two verses, he shares three ways to do that. There's four verbs in these two verses. One is the main idea. It's a subjunctive. It's run. The other three are participles. What it means, they modify the run. And what it means is they show you how to run. And when you look at the original language, what you see is the three other words, and you can see them in the text, having a great cloud of witnesses, number one. Two, throwing aside weight and sin. Three, looking to Jesus. Those three are how you run. Now, the ESV kind of takes the having and kind of moves it out a little bit, but the idea is there. How do we run? We run by having a great cloud of witnesses. We run by throwing aside weight and sin. We run by looking to Jesus. Those are how we do it. And so let's just take a minute on each one of them and explain each one of them. Number one, what's the big idea? It's what? In one word, run. How do we run? Number one, having a great cloud of witnesses. What's he getting at? Well, again, we would have read through the entire text. We would have known what he's talking about, the great cloud of witnesses. The previous chapter is Hebrews 11, which is the faith chapter. That is the cloud of witnesses. All of these Old Testament saints. Now, you can take this in one of two ways. You can take this idea is the Old Testament saints are, A, watching us currently. Or you can take it as we have their witness, their testimony. I vote with B. I don't believe the saints of the Old Testament are watching us, and there's a number of reasons why I believe that, but I believe we have their testimony. We have their witness. In fact, I think in chapter 11, verse 4, you see that explicitly with Abel. When he mentions Abel in Hebrews 11, 4, he says, though he died, he still speaks. What does that mean? That doesn't mean Abel's watching us. It means in Genesis 4, we have what he, his life, and we can see his example. Though he's dead, he speaks to us. It brings a question, what is the purpose of the Bible? Now, that's, that's a huge question. But I can give you one of the, the purposes right here from the text. What, why did the New Testament saints have the Old Testament? Why do the saints today have the New and the Old Testament? Well, there's a lot of ways we can explain that. But Paul, in Romans 15, 4, said this. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance, that's a running word, through endurance and encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. The reason the New Testament saints had the Old Testament was to encourage them to run. 
The reason we have the new in the Old Testament today is to encourage us to run. And, and we have those because when we're in the Word, we see the examples of the saints of the past. That presupposes something. If I know about the examples of the saints of the past, that means what? I'm in the Word. And so knowing their example, having the example implies that I'm in this. Because it's more than just a guide to encouragement. This is spiritual food. It would be sort of like the idea of, I don't need to eat today. I ate last week. No, no one would ever say that. I ate yesterday and the day before, and I need to eat today. And that's what this word is. It's spiritual food. Some of you may be familiar with the Navigators, the, the organization, and I love their, their hand model. How do you grasp the word of God? Ephesians 6, the Bible calls itself the sword of the spirit. And if I'm going to grasp a sword, I need all four fingers and a thumb. So how do you grasp the word of God? You hear the word of God. You read the word of God. You study the word of God. You memorize the word of God. And then you wrap it together, you meditate on the word of God. When you do that, you can begin to wield it correctly. But you begin to miss one of those steps, and you, you don't fully grasp what the word of God is about. How do we run the race? Part of that is through the word of God. When I'm in the word, I see the examples of the saints, and they encourage, and they can warn me. Running is important. Having a cloud of witnesses helps me to run. Number two, throwing off weights and sins help us to run. Now, there's, there's two things here, but one action. The action is throw off, get rid of. It's the principle, it's easier to run with less. Right? I can run in a jacket, but I'd rather run in just a t-shirt. I can run with a rucksack on, but I'd rather not. It's easier to run with less. And this is the idea. There's some things in your race, in my race, we need to get rid of. The, the second one is obvious, sin. The Bible talks over and over and over. You can't run with sin in your life. Now, pause. We're all sinners. That's right. Jesus is our perfection. But what I think it's getting at is the idea of persistent sin that I just continue to have. In fact, the author of Psalm, Psalm 66, 18, said this, If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. What does that mean? What it means is this, you can't run and persistently sin. You've got to get rid of it. When we come to Christ through the gospel, he saves us from all sin. And every day I repent of my daily sin. It's an already right now kind of thing. We are challenged as Christians to have holy, not sinful attitudes. We are challenged as Christians to have holy and not sinful talk. We are challenged as Christians to have holy and not sinful thoughts. We are challenged as Christians to have holy and not sinful responses. We all struggle, and when we struggle with these things, we should get on our knees and we should repent and we should give it to God and throw it off. Why? Because we need to run. And so when it comes to sin, we have to shuck it off through Christ. But the fascinating thing in the text is this. It's more than sin, it says, to throw off. It, every word in the Bible has meaning. It's not, well, I'll just throw something in there. The author of Hebrews could have just said throw off sin and left it, but he didn't. He said, throw off every weight and sin. What does that mean? Well, unfortunately, he doesn't unpack it for us. But let me share a suggestion. There may be things in our lives that aren't sin. But the question we need to ask ourselves is this. Does it help me run? It's not sin. But does it help me run? run. You know, I, I once heard a sermon on this topic, and actually I shared with somebody yesterday over the phone who's struggling with a few things. And what we talked about is what the most minimal response to, to questionable things are is this. What's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it? What I see when I look at this verse, a Christian should never ask what's wrong with it. A Christian should ask does it help me run? 
Now, what's wrong with it? That's a minimalist question. Does it help me run? Does it help those around me run the spiritual race? But you know the only people that ask that question are runners. People that don't run don't ask that question. And those who are runners ask, does it help me run? I can eat that. I could do that, but does it help me run? It may not be sin, but does it help me run my race? Does it help my wife run hers? You know, you could go example after example. Excuse me, I, I'm just checking Facebook. No, I'm not. Look. Social media. Not inherently evil. Not somebody might say, oh, it's evil. It's not inherently evil. But here's the thing. It could be a weight. If I spend more time on this than with my wife, it may be a weight. It's not inherently evil, but does it help me run? Or maybe I have to be disciplined in this. My hobbies, they're not wrong. I don't even have hobbies at this point. I've got six kids. I'm doing a PhD program. I've got a job. I don't have any hobbies at this point. One day I will. But I don't have any right now. But if I had a hobby, does it help me run? And sometimes the answer is yes. Hey, I need to get away. I need to go fish. I just need it because it helps me run. And sometimes it doesn't because I'm trying to get away and not come back. There's a, there's a step there. <laughs> I'm a walker, and this has been very challenging, but I'm doing it. Does it help me run? Sometimes I need to throw off the things that don't help me run. Not, not sin. Sin's already been addressed. But there may be something else. And the question is, does it help me run? Running is important. Having a cloud of witnesses helps me to run. Throwing off weights and sin help me to run. Number three, lastly, and probably most importantly, looking to Jesus helps me run. Church, that's been the focus from chapter 1 to now in the book of Hebrews. Look to Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is... Starts with a G, rhymes with... Blader. Greater. All right. Jesus, let's all say it. I'll say it and you repeat it. Jesus is greater. Do we believe that? Jesus is greater than anything. Now, it, he was writing, writing to a Hebrew audience with the, you know, Christians that had a Hebrew background, which is why the arguments are angels and Moses... It wouldn't be the same argument if you wrote it today because we don't concern ourselves with that so much. But what do we concern ourselves with? Whatever your fill in the blank is, guess what? Jesus is greater. Look to him. I love how he starts the book of Hebrews, and I'd encourage you to just turn back there very quickly. Those first four verses, this is who Jesus is, according to the author of Hebrews. Long ago, verse 1 of chapter 1, many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. He upholds the universe by the word of his power, and after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much more superior to angels uh, in name than he inherited is more excellent than theirs. He starts off with this eightfold, this is who Jesus is. He's an heir, he's a creator, he's a reflector, he's the exactness, he's a sustainer, he's a redeemer, he's the ruler, he's the inheritor. We don't usually think about it, but Jesus is the creator of the world. When God the Father spoke, John 1 says Jesus is the word. What comes out when you speak? Word. Jesus made the world. Jesus sustains the world. You know why your heart is beating right now? Because Jesus is allowing it to be. Do you know why your lungs are expanding and contracting right now? Because Jesus is allowing them to expand and contract. And one day they won't. And that will be because of Jesus too. He created us. He sustains us. It's all for his glory. So what do we need to do? Look to him and run. A good runner knows you don't look behind, you don't look around, you, you look forward. You, you get, you put your eyes and you focus 
and you usually focus on something. If, you, if you're on a PT test, it's the guy in front of you. Why? Because he's my rabbit, and I'm going to catch him, and I'm going to watch him, and I'm going to pick him off, and then I'm going to pick the next guy, and then the next guy, and then the next guy, and the next guy. Guess what? In the race of faith, the next guy is Jesus, and it's Jesus, and it's Jesus, and it's Jesus, and we get anxious, and we get distracted, and we get bothered. Why? Because we take the focus off of Jesus in our heart. Running is important. Having a cloud of witnesses helps us to run. Throwing off weights and sins helps us to run. Looking to Jesus helps us to run. And you know what? When I look to Jesus, when I look at him in scripture, you know what I'm aware of? That when Jesus ran his race on earth, he was looking to us. Do you know that? That's what it says in verse 2 of chapter 12. What does it say? Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. What was that? That's you. When Jesus ran his race, he thought of you, of me, so that when we can run ours, we can think of him. So my question for application today is simply this. How are you running? Every one of us is in a different place in life. Every one of us is, has a slightly different situation. But the question I have for you this morning is this. Are you really running? The early church had been believers for 20 years, 30 years, and they started to meander. And the author of Hebrews says, no, 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 don't meander. You haven't hit the tape yet. Right? Because what's the Christian retirement plan? Heaven. Until I hit the tape and go to heaven, I'm here for a purpose. I've been called to run. In fact, I, I, I love how he says it in verse, I'll just read it. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin and let us run the race with endurance that has been set out for us. When I run the PT test, it has been laid out for me. I don't have to figure it out. Oh, where am I going? Where am I going? This race that we are running, and some of you have been running for 40 years, 50 years, 80 years, this is a race that has been set for you. You don't have to figure it out. You just have to take the next step. You just have to run. Last story and I'm done. When I, I used to be a field artillery officer, and my first assignment in the Army was, was Germany, uh, bomb holder Germany. I showed up uh, January of 2003. They were loading up, brand new fire support officer. They said, we're rolling. I was like, where? We're going to Iraq. And we did. And, uh, and we were in Iraq for 15 months. While I did that, uh, my wife Amanda decided she would run the marathon. She ran a Ber uh, the Berlin Marathon in 2003, 2004. Um, she did not win. But she finished, and when she finished, she received a medal. I look at that very much like the Christian life. Everyone who finishes wins. Everyone who finishes receives the medal. But you can run for a mile and decide you're not going to finish, and you will not receive the prize. You could run for 22 miles and not finish and not receive the prize. But the minute you cross the finish line, you receive the prize. All of those who persevere to the end will be saved. And those who are saved will persevere to the end. Hebrews encourages today, run. Will you do that? Let's pray together. Father God, I am so grateful for your word. It is challenging. It is encouraging. And Father, we don't have to overthink it. We just have to, by faith, take the next step. I pray that in our lives, wherever we're at, we would just do what you call us to do, which is run. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand at this time and sing with me.
Jesus, keep me near the cross. so much for allowing me to open God's word with you today. Receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up your countenance and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.
test, 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 test. Test, test, test. Test, test, test. Did he say it in here? Because I know it's put my drink in that order. Test, test, test. Good morning, good morning everyone. 
Welcome to the Fort Leavenworth Multicultural Gospel Service. 